By popular request, this week's Sabbath Sunday upload will be the full-length talk by Chris Check on the topic of the Battle of Lepanto. It ends with a rousing rendition of G.K. Chesterton's legendary poem by the same name. In the coming days, I should have an overview of Our Lady of La Salette up, as well as the latest madness from the Synod and the crisis in the Church. Have a blessed Sunday. Have you ever heard of the Battle of Lepanto? the most important naval contest in Christian history. Perhaps you have heard of this 16th century battle, but if asked to locate Lepanto on a map, or to name the date of the battle, or to say who fought whom, or to identify the heroes of the day, or to describe what was at stake, you could not. If you are an American Catholic, by that I mean a Roman Catholic living in America, there is a reason you may be unfamiliar with the Battle of Lepanto. Lepanto is a signal moment in Catholic history, and America is a Protestant country. More specifically, America is a British Protestant country. That is why Americans, or the few Americans who still learn dates, recognize 1066 as the year the Normans invaded England. Few Americans, however, know that More than a decade before Hastings, the Normans invaded another part of Europe with equal, if not greater, implications for the history of Christendom. Had the Normans not wrested control of Sicily from the Saracens in the second half of the 11th century, the great military event of the Christian ages, the Crusades, would have been a strategic and logistic impossibility. Sicily was an indispensable point of embarkation and resupply for Christian soldiers headed for the Holy Land to defend the cross against the forces of Islam. Americans know that in 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue, but few know that in the same year, the heroic Catholic monarchs Ferdinand and Isabella conquered the Moors in Granada, making Christian Europe whole again. What if the category were great sea battles of the second half of the 16th century? Many Americans might recognize 1588, the defeat of the Spanish Armada by Francis Drake and the rest of Queen Elizabeth's pirates was a tragedy for the Catholic Kingdom of Spain and a triumph for the Protestant British Empire, and it determined the kind of history that would one day be taught in American schools. Protestant British history. But on October 7th, 1571, 17 years before the Spanish Armada, a far more important battle raged for the outcome determined whether or not the West would remain Christian or fall to the Islamic Ottoman Empire. It was a very near-run thing, and a victory for which we can thank the Blessed Mother. But we are getting ahead. Catholics have a duty to know Catholic history, and a good place to start is the liturgical calendar. Take any saint's day. For example, April 29th, Feast of Catherine of Siena. Here is a chance to learn about the Avignon Papacy and the Western Schism that followed or November 23rd. The memorial of Blessed Miguel Pro is a chance to learn of the trials endured and heroism shown by our Mexican brethren under a government overtly hostile to the Catholic Church. If your interests tend, like mine, toward things martial, you should know that there are at least four liturgical feasts that celebrate military victories. May 24th, Our Lady Help of Christians, commemorates the defeat of one of history's greatest generals and most wicked men, Napoleon Bonaparte. September 12th, the Holy Name of Mary, celebrates the victory of John Sobieski and his Polish warriors over the Ottoman Turks at the gates of Vienna in 1683. In 1456, Pope Callistus III elevated the Feast of the Transfiguration to the Universal Calendar to celebrate the victory over Islam at the ramparts of Belgrade, 
where the Hungarian, John Hunyadi, the Italian, John Capistrano, and the Romanian, Vlad Dracul, joined forces to stop the Turkish assault on Eastern Europe. And October 7th, Our Lady of the Rosary celebrates the topic of this series, the glorious victory at Lepanto. Note that three of these feasts are Marian feasts, underscoring our image of the Blessed Virgin prefigured in the Canticle of Canticles. Who is she that cometh forth as the morning rising, fair as the moon, bright as the sun, terrible as an army set in array? It is little wonder that the Crusaders from 11th century Jerusalem to the 18th century Vendée have put themselves under the special protection of Mary. Her intercession preserved the Holy League at Lepanto. But I am getting ahead again. Let's begin the story in the year 612 AD when a camel driver, to borrow Hilaire Belloc's phrase, named Muhammad, found popularity by inventing a new religion. Muhammad was not a fool. He did not invent Islam out of whole cloth, but cobbled it together out of Jewish mythology here, some heathen Arabi there, and even some bits and pieces of the gospel. The new religion was custom made for a people whose chief joys were fighting and carnal pleasure. A life of the former spent in the service of spreading this new religion would be rewarded by an eternity of the latter. Among these sons of the desert, Islam caught on. Now, fast forward 1,000 years. Islam was now the driving force behind the great Ottoman Empire, which had at last conquered the Roman Empire in the east with the fall of Constantinople in 1453. The Turks found Islam appealing for the same reasons Arabs did, and a century after the fall of Constantinople, in October of 1564, the viziers of the divan of the Ottoman Empire assembled to urge their sultan to prepare for war. Many more difficult victories have fallen to your scimitar than the capture of a handful of men on a tiny little island that is not well fortified, they told him. Though flattery, their words were no less true. During the five-decade reign of Suleiman the Magnificent, the Ottoman Empire had grown to its glory, encompassing the Caucasus, the Balkans, Anatolia, the Middle East, and North Africa. Suleiman had conquered Aden, Algiers, Baghdad, Belgrade, Budapest, Rhodes, and Temesvar. His war galleys terrorized not only the Mediterranean Sea, but the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf as well. His one defeat, the gates of Vienna, 1529. The tiny little island that the sultan's counselors now wanted their lord to invest was called Malta. Located anywhere other than where God had put it, the island may well have remained unknown to history. An infertile, dusty rock with so few natural springs that the Maltese collected their drinking water in large clay urns when it rained, the island could sustain only the smallest population. Yet, in the 16th century Mediterranean world, Malta guarded the sea passage from the Islamic East to the Christian West. From Malta's harbor, the galleys of the Knights of St. John could sail forth and disrupt the logistical lines of any Turkish assault on Italy. They could also practice a kind of Christian piracy, if you will, boarding and seizing the occasional Turkish merchantman carrying goods from France or Venice to be hawked in the markets of Constantinople. The matrons of Suleiman's harem hated the Knights of Malta for this very reason, for these ladies accumulated great wealth speculating in glass and other Venetian luxuries. Suleiman, however, was a strategic thinker. He had bigger goals than pleasing a palace full of well-rounded harem girls. He knew that the magnificent natural harbors of Malta 
in Turkish possession would afford him a forward base without equal from which to continue his raids on the coast of Italy. With the greater control of the sea that Malta would afford him, he could at last bring Venice to heel. An invasion of Sicily would not be out of the question, nor would aid to the Moriscos in Spain. The Moriscos were Moorish converts who, well, never converted. Even as Solomon was making his designs on Malta, bands of Morisco rebels were forming in the mountains of Spain and within two years would be in full-scale rebellion against King Philip II. Solomon's greatest dream, however, the dream of all Turks, the dream his soldiers toasted with sherbet before setting off on each and every campaign, was the conquest of the Red Apple, Rome. There, the Turks could transform Michelangelo's St. Peter's, even then under construction, into a mosque, just as they had done to Constantinople's Hagia Sophia in 1453. In short, Malta was a stepping stone to Rome. Solomon had crossed swords with the Knights of St. John early in his reign. Four decades earlier, the Sultan's army, a force of, in the end, some 200,000, besieged the Knights' stronghold on the island of Rhodes. For six months, 700 Knights of St. John, joined by 6,000 local auxiliaries, held out against the Turks. The Holy Knights exacted casualties from Suleiman, equaling half his force. But when their supplies and ammunition were exhausted and their own force inadequate to man the walls, Suleiman agreed to allow the garrison to surrender on terms. Rhodes was evacuated, and the knights in time set up a new fortress on the island of Malta. Although Suleiman throughout his reign had led his army on no fewer than 12 major campaigns, his age would keep him from joining the siege of Malta. The Turks sailed for Malta in the spring of 1565, and on May 18th, their fleet was spotted offshore. That night, Jean de la Valette, the 71-year-old Grand Master of the Knights of St. John, led his warriors into their chapel, where they confessed and then assisted at the holy sacrifice of the Mass. A formidable army composed of audacious barbarians is descending on this island, he told them. These persons, my brothers, are the enemies of Jesus Christ. Today it is a question of the defense of our faith. Are the Gospels to be superseded by the Koran? God on this occasion demands of us our lives already vowed to his service. Happy will be those who first consummate this sacrifice. Many of Lavalette's 700 knights and their men-at-arms did consummate that sacrifice. But while Europe stood idly by expecting the fortress to fall, the knights held their island against an Ottoman army of nearly 60,000, including 6,500 of the Sultan's elite Janissaries. Three quarters of the Turkish army were killed over the four-month siege. And as the Ottoman survivors turned and straggled back to Constantinople, a sense began to spread throughout Europe that the Sultan's armies were not so invincible after all. The sense in Constantinople was rage. I see that it is only in my own hand that my sword is invincible, exploded the Sultan. And by June of the following year, at 72 years of age and suffering from gout, he was leading an army of 300,000 men across the plains of Hungary, bound for Vienna. When Miklos Zrinyi, the Hungarian count of Zygatvar, a fortress city on the eastern frontier of the Holy Roman Empire, led a successful raid on the Ottoman supply trains, Suleiman wheeled his massive army around and swore to wipe the city off the map. Turkish engineers prepared flotillas and bridges to span the Drava and Danube rivers to lay siege to Zygatvar. To greet the sultan and to inspire his men who were outnumbered 50 to 1, 
Zhrinyi raised a large crucifix over his battlements and fired his cannons in defiance. Both armies' thoughts turned to the previous year's contest on Malta, though Zhrinyi knew that with a Hungary infested with Protestantism, hope of relief was even more faint than that entertained a year ago by the Knights of Malta. For nearly a month, wave after wave of Turkish infantry were thrown back from the city walls. Suleiman offered Zhrinyi rule of all Croatia if he would but yield his city. But the count had his soul set on another sort of glory. No one shall point his finger at my children in contempt, he answered. When the breaches made by Turkish artillery were too large to defend, the Catholic count assembled his last 600 men. With this sword, he shouted, holding the bejeweled weapon aloft. I earned my first honor and glory. I want to appear with it once more before the eternal throne to hear my judgment. Charging out from the remains of their stronghold, the courageous band was swallowed by a sea of Turks. To the last man, the Hungarian knights died defending the Christian West. The Turks, furious at the losses their army had suffered, consoled themselves according to their grisly custom. They slaughtered every Christian civilian who had survived the siege. Suleiman the Magnificent did not witness the massacre, for he had died of dysentery in his tent four days prior. Had he survived, however, to see this Ottoman victory on the remote Hungarian frontier, it would have given him no comfort. The capture of Zygatvar was altogether Peric. The Ottoman army had exhausted itself on the siege and was in no condition to carry on the campaign. Though all dead, Count Zhrinyi and his heroic band were the true victors. Back in Constantinople, Suleiman's son ascended the throne by the usual Ottoman method. A complex harem intrigue designed to kill off his worthier brothers. Unlike every previous sultan, however, Selim II, nicknamed the Sot, had little interest in warfare. His enthusiasms were wine, his extraordinary and extraordinarily deviant sexual appetite, wine, poetry, though he was a lesser poet than his father, and wine. Nonetheless, he knew that without a decisive victory, the mighty empire his father had left him would face eclipse. Selim decided to invade the Venetian colony of Cyprus. His reasons were simple. To begin, Cyprus was not far from Constantinople, and mounting an assault would be logistically simpler than a campaign farther afield. Further, half the population of Cyprus were Greek Orthodox serfs laboring under the exacting rule of their Venetian Roman Catholic masters. They might very well offer little resistance to an Ottoman takeover. Finally, Cyprus was the source of Selim's favorite vintage. Had Selim known how half-hearted was Venice herself about defending the island, he would have been all the more enthusiastic. When word of the invasion reached Venice, the Senate voted by the very small margin of 220 to 199 to defend their colony. The Turks rolled through Cyprus. After a 46-day siege, the capital city of Nicosia fell on September 9, 1570. The 500 Venetians of the garrison surrendered on terms, but once the city gates were opened, the Turks rushed in and slaughtered them all. Then the Turks set on the civilian population. 20,000 were massacred, some, as historian Jack Beeching writes, 
in such bizarre ways that those merely put to the sword were lucky. Every house was plundered. Mothers, to protect their daughters from rape, stabbed them and then themselves or threw themselves from the rooftops. Two thousand of the prettier boys and girls were gathered and shipped off as sexual provender for the slave markets in Constantinople. Soon the news reached Western Europe that only the port city of Famagusta on the eastern coast of the island held out. Spain and the Italian republics began to realize that only a united front would stop the continued assaults of the Ottoman Empire. Had the matter of such an alliance been left to the rulers of these various states, St. Peter's Basilica might well have become a mosque. But God intervened and sent one of history's greatest popes, Pope St. Pius V, who declared, I am taking up arms against the Turks, but the only thing that can help me is the prayers of priests of pure life. An aged Dominican priest, Michael Ghislieri, when he ascended the chair of Peter, faced two foes, Protestantism and Islam. He was up to the task. He had served as Grand Inquisitor, and the austerity of his private mortifications contrasted with the lifestyles pursued by his Renaissance predecessors. During his six-year reign, he promulgated the Council of Trent, published the works of Thomas Aquinas, issued the Roman Catechism, issued a new missal, issued a new breviary, created 21 cardinals, excommunicated Queen Elizabeth, and led, aided by St. Charles Borromeo, the reform of a clergy and episcopacy that had grown soft and degenerate. Even while Pope, he made a habit of visiting the sick in Rome's hospitals and caring for them with his own hands. In a papacy of great achievements, the greatest came on March 7, 1571, on the feast of his fellow Dominican, St. Thomas Aquinas. At the Dominican church of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva in Rome, Pope Pius V formed the Holy League. Genoa, the Papal States, and the Kingdom of Spain put aside their jealousies and pledged to assemble a fleet capable of confronting the Sultan's war galleys before the east coast of Italy became the next front line in the war between Christianity and Islam. The day was not a total triumph. Venice refused to join. Although at open war with the Turks over Cyprus, the Venetians never failed to consider their economy. They might well lose Cyprus, but a fast peace afterwards would lead to the resumption of normal trade relations with the Turks. Moreover, the loss of the Venetian fleet in an all-out battle with the Sultan's galleys would be a disaster for a state so dependent on seaborne commerce. From the Pope's perspective, the Venetians had traded their birthright as Christians for a mess of pottage. Walking back across the Tiber, the old monk wept for the future of Christendom. For he knew that without the galleys of Venice, there was no hope of mounting a fleet sufficient to face the Turk. The rest of Europe ignored Pius's call for a new crusade. The bastard Queen of England, Elizabeth I, in open rebellion against Rome, was too busy confiscating Holy Mother Church's monasteries to enrich her cronies and putting to sword and stake English defenders of the Holy Mass to be of any help. In the years to come, Elizabeth would, through her spy master Walsingham, actively enlist the aid of the Turks in her wars against Spain. Pius wrote a personal letter to Charles IX, the Valois King of France, asking for his help. But Charles's mother, history's real-life Lady Macbeth, Catherine de' Medici, was calling the shots in France, and Charles wrote back, No. 
France, in fact, had openly traded with the Turks for years and had, as recently as 1569, drawn up an extensive commercial treaty with the Turks brokered by a powerful Jewish banker named Joseph Mikas. For years, the French had allowed Turkish ships to harbor in Toulon, and the oars that rowed Turkish galleys came from Marseille. The cannons that brought down the walls of Ziegfeld were of French design. Further, with Venice at war with Constantinople, markets once filled by Venetian goods were now open to France. Redeeming France from utter disgrace were the Knights of St. John of Malta, ever eager to do battle with Islam, who sent their galleys to join the Holy League. As the Pope prayed for Venice to answer her higher call, a new breed of fiery priests led by such stirring preachers as San Francisco Borgia, Superior General of the Jesuits, inspired the hearts of Christian Europeans throughout the Mediterranean with their sermons against Islam. Enough Venetians must have been listening. And on May 25th, Venice joined the Holy League. Not only did the struggle for Cyprus continue, but African corsairs in the service of the Sultan were raiding off the Venetian coast within cannon shot of the Basilica San Marco. An explosion and fire, the source of which today remains unsolved, in the famous Venetian arsenal further focused Venetian priorities. By fits and starts, and not without hesitation and quarreling on the part of a few of the principal players, the fleet of the Holy League was forming. The man in whom there was not a shred of hesitation was the one chosen by Pius V to serve as Captain General of the Holy League. Don John of Austria, the illegitimate son of the late Holy Roman Emperor Charles V and half-brother of Philip II, King of Spain. The young commander had distinguished himself in combat against Barbary corsairs and in the Morisco Rebellion in Spain, a campaign during which he demonstrated his capacity for swift violence when the threat called for it and restraint when charity demanded it. He was a great horseman, a great swordsman, and a great dancer. With charm, wit, and good looks in abundance, he was, to say the least, popular among the ladies at court. Since his childhood, he had cultivated a deep devotion to the Blessed Virgin. He spoke Latin, French, Italian, and Spanish. He kept a pet marmoset and a pet lion cub that slept at the foot of his bed. He was 24 years old. Taking the young warrior by the shoulders, Pius V looked Don John of Austria in the eye and declared, The Turks, swollen by their victories, will wish to take on our fleet. And God, I have the pious presentiment, will give us a victory. Charles V gave you life. I will give you honor and greatness. Go and seek them out. As Don John was making his way in late summer of 1571 to the harbor at Messina to take command of his fleet, the situation on Cyprus grew more desperate. The Venetian colonists had claimed the lives of some 50,000 Turks with their intrepid defense of Famagusta. But when all their supplies and gunpowder were exhausted, and when they had eaten their last horse, their shrewd governor, Marcantonio Bragadino, sent a message to the Turkish commander, Lala Mustafa, asking for terms. The Turks agreed to give the remaining Venetian soldiers passage to Crete on 14 Turkish galleys in exchange for surrender of the city. The Greek Cypriots could retain their property and their religion. On August 4th, 1571, Bragadino, with a small entourage, including several young pages, met with 
Lala Mustafa and his advisors in the Turkish general's tent. Mustafa lecherously demanded Bragadino's page, Antonio Quirini, as a hostage for the 14 galleys. When Bragadino calmly refused, he and his men were pushed out of the tent by Mustafa's guards. Bragadino was bound and forced to watch as the members of his entourage were hacked to pieces. The boys were let off in chains. The Turks thrice thrust the Venetian governor's neck on the executioner's block and thrice lifted it off. Instead of his head, they cut off his nose and ears. To prevent his bleeding to death, they cauterized the wounds with hot irons. The Venetian soldiers of the garrison, unaware that Mustafa had broken the terms, began their march down to the galleys expecting passage to Crete. Once aboard, the Venetians were set upon by Turkish soldiers who stripped them of their clothes and chained them to the oars. From their benches they witnessed the horrifying ordeal to which the Turks now subjected their governor. First, the Turks fitted Bragadino with a harness and bridle and led him around the Turkish camp on his hands and knees. Slung across his back were ass panniers filled with dung. Each time he passed Lala Mustafa's tent, he was forced to kiss the ground. Next, he was strung up in chains, hoisted over a galley spar, and left to hang for a time. Finally, the courageous governor was dragged into the city square and lashed to the pillory where the Turks flayed him alive. Witnesses said they heard him whispering a Latin prayer. He died when the executioner's knife reached the height of his navel. The diabolical orgy did not end there. Mustafa had the governor's skin stuffed, hoisted it up the mast of his galley, and joined the Ottoman fleet headed west. As Bragadino was losing his life to Turkish monsters, Don John was inspecting his ships. Of the 206 galleys and 76 smaller boats that comprised the Holy League, more than half came from Venice. The next biggest contingent came from Spain, which included galleys from Sicily, Naples, Portugal, and Genoa, the latter owned by the Genovese Condottiere Admiral Gian Andrea Doria. Not only was Doria renting his services and the use of his ships to Philip at costs 30% higher than Philip paid to run his own galleys, he was lending the Spanish king the money at 14%. The balance of the galleys came from the Holy See. When Don John took charge of his fleet in the Straits of Messina, he promptly forbade women from coming aboard the galleys. He declared that blasphemy among the crews would be punishable by death. The whole fleet followed his example and made a three-day fast. Though he had not yet learned of the fate of Famagusta, Don John knew that the Ottoman fleet was sailing west. He could only guess, he would have been right, that the young Ottoman admiral, Muezzin Ziade Ali Pasha, had explicit orders from Selim II to engage the Christians in a pitched battle. After a sortie as far north as the Gulf of Prevesa, the Ottoman fleet comprising some 230 galleys and some 70 smaller craft, including the swift, shallow-draft galleots of the African Corsairs, harbored in the Bay of Lepanto on the north side of the Gulf of Patras. By September 28th, the Holy League had made its way across the Adriatic Sea and was anchored between the west coast of Greece and the island of Corfu. By this time, news of the death of Bragadino had reached the Holy League, and the Venetians, especially, were determined to settle the score. 
Don John reminded all of his fleet that the battle they would soon face was as much spiritual as physical. Pius V had granted a plenary indulgence to the soldiers and crews of the Holy League. Priests of the great orders, Franciscans, Capuchins, Dominicans, Theatines, and Jesuits were stationed on the decks of the Holy League's galleys offering Mass and hearing confessions. Many of the men who rowed the Christian galleys were criminals, thieves or debtors or men who had killed their wives' lovers. Don John ordered them all unchained, and he issued them each a weapon, promising them their freedom if they fought bravely. He then issued to every man in his fleet a weapon more powerful than anything the Turks could muster. A rosary. On the eve of the battle, the men of the Holy League prepared their souls by falling to their knees on the decks of their galleys and praying the rosary. Back in Rome and up and down the Italian peninsula, at the behest of Pius V, the churches were filled with the faithful telling their beads. In heaven, the Blessed Mother, her immaculate heart aflame, was listening. In the quiet of the night, Don John of Austria met with his admirals on the deck of his flagship, Real, to review once more the order of battle. He had divided his fleet into four squadrons, commanding a squadron of 54 galleys on Don John's left flank was a Venetian warrior named Augustine Barbarigo. The center squadron of 55 galleys was commanded by Don John, assisted on either side by his vice admirals, the Roman, Marc Antonio Colonna, and the Venetian, Sebastian Veniero. Directly behind the center squadron, Don John stationed a reserve squadron of 38 galleys led by Spain's greatest naval commander, Don Alvaro de Bazan, the Marquis of Santa Cruz. The right squadron of 53 galleys was under the command of the Genovese, Gian Andrea Doria. Arrayed for battle, the mighty armada of the Holy League looked like nothing if not a Latin cross. Doria, whatever we might suspect about his mercenary motives, had been the source of sound tactical counsel. Cut off the spars in the prows of the fleet's galleys, he told Don John. To appreciate the merits of Doria's advice, it helps to understand the ordnance with which 16th century war galleys were equipped. Depending on their size, most galleys sported one large and two or four smaller centerline muzzle-loading cannons mounted on recoiling carriages on the ship's bow. The smaller guns flanked the main gun, of which they weighed roughly a third. Their total weight would not exceed that of the main gun, a maximum of 6,000 pounds for larger galleys. The guns had no mechanism for traversing left and right. In other words, to aim the cannons required pivoting the entire galley. This fact alone helps us appreciate the skill required to pilot a galley, especially in the heat of battle. The muzzles of the cannons could, however, be elevated or depressed. Nevertheless, if they were depressed too far, their fire would be obstructed by the spar or spiron that protruded from the galley's bow. Mediterranean galleys had been equipped with bow spars or rams since before the days of Salamis, when the Greeks in 480 BC defeated the Persians in another sea battle that saved the West. On an ancient Greek galley, the ram, made of bronze, was built 
into the ship's hull at the waterline, making the galley itself a torpedo designed to puncture a fatal hole in the hull of an enemy galley during a perpendicular collision. The spars on 16th century galleys, made of wood and tipped with metal, were above the waterline at the level of the main deck because they were designed not to puncture an enemy hull, but to tear apart the telaro, the large rectangular outrigger frame that supported the galley's oars. A glancing blow, rather than a perpendicular one, was considered ideal to achieve this effect. Once ships had collided, the spiron was used as a bridge for boarding. In this regard, galley warfare of the Renaissance was more like that of the First Punic War in the middle of the 3rd century BC, during which the Romans, good soldiers but not skilled sailors, developed a swinging bridge called a corvus that locked their galleys to the galleys of the Carthaginians. The effect was to transform a naval battle into a land battle. Roman soldiers would charge across the corvus to board and take enemy vessels in hand-to-hand combat. A Roman legionary might have felt at home during much of the fighting at Lepanto once the two fleets had collided. Contemporary accounts tell of soldiers racing from ship to ship to ship, so thickly were the two fleets engaged. What a Roman soldier would not recognize, of course, because it had not made its appearance aboard Mediterranean war galleys until the century before Lepanto, was gunpowder artillery, and the Holy League carried twice as many cannon as the Ottomans. It was this advantage in artillery that Doria's suggestion was designed to exploit. By cutting off the spars at the bows of each galley, the gunners of the Holy League could engage an enemy ship at much closer range than could their Ottoman counterparts, whose rounds aimed high to avoid their bow spars would either sail over their targets completely or, at worst, tear at rigging and sails. Rounds aimed low from the cannons of the Holy League would blast holes in the Turkish hulls at or below the water line. It was to the Holy League's advantage, of course, to engage the Ottoman ships with their cannons at as close a range as possible. Although many of the fleet's larger guns could fire their 30-pound balls as far as 8 kilometers, accuracy at that range was difficult to achieve, particularly if the ship was pitching, even in light sea. Don John took John Andrea Doria's advice, and his famous order to remove these spars was a milestone in naval warfare heralding the age of gunpowder and also signaling the eventual passing of hand-to-hand fighting at sea. Doria also advised taking the League's six galleuses and stationing them in the van, two before each of the three forward squadrons. A galleus was a large Venetian multi-decked merchant galley, about one and a half times the size of an ordinary galley. Each galleus had been outfitted with cannons, not only at its bow, but also along its port and starboard sides, as well as in the stern. Where an ordinary galley was most vulnerable, a galleus packed heavy firepower. Don John increased the lethality of his galleuses by packing the decks with hundreds of Spanish arquebusiers. An arquebus was an early handheld gun. Although heavy and slow to load, their murderous fire would tear into the flesh of Ottoman soldiers who did not wear armor. 
These six galleasses were slow moving and had to be towed to their positions a kilometer or so in front of each of the league's three squadrons. But they would provide a powerful shock at the start of the battle, one from which the Ottoman fleet would not recover. Gian Andrea Doria was an admiral, but he was also a ship owner. Before the Council of War concluded, Doria looked at Don John, raised his eyebrows, opened his palm, and offered, There is still time, Excellency, to avoid pitched battle. The young Captain General stood surrounded by men older and with greater seafaring and military experience than he. Indeed, Sebastian Vignero was 76 years old, more than three times Don John's age. Silence filled the small stateroom as these men waited to hear their leader's response. He caught their eyes, each one of them, as he looked around. Gentlemen, he said, the time for counsel has passed. Now is the time for war. It was. In the dawn's mist of October 7, 1571, the holy sacrifice of the Mass was offered aboard the galleys of the Holy League. Then the fleet rode down the west coast of Greece and turned east into the Gulf of Petras. The men pulling at the oars of the Christian galleys strained to move their ships against a strong headwind. When the morning mist cleared, the Christians saw the squadrons of the larger Ottoman fleet arrayed like a crescent and stretched from shore to shore, bearing down on them under full sail. As the fleets drew closer, the Christians could hear the gongs and cymbals, drums and war cries of the Turks. Don John boarded a fregata, a small, swift vessel, and made his way up and down the battle line, shouting to the ships, telling the men of the Holy League, My children, we are here to claim victory or to die. In either case, we will win immortality. The men of the Holy League silently pulled at their oars. The soldiers stood on the decks in quiet prayer. Priests marched up and down the decks, and some climbed up in the rigging, holding aloft crucifixes, exhorting the men to be brave, hearing final confessions. And then the Blessed Virgin intervened. The wind shifted 180 degrees. The Ottomans were forced to strike their sails, and the tens of thousands of Christian galley slaves who rowed the Turkish boats were whipped up from under their benches. The Latin sails of the Holy League were filled with the divine breath, driving them into battle. Don John knelt for a final prayer on the prow of Real. He stood up and gave the order for the Holy League's battle standard, a gift from Pope Pius V, to be unfurled. Christians up and down the battle line watched the giant blue banner bearing an image of our Lord crucified, straining in the wind. They let forth a cheer of confidence in their young commander and hope in their God. On a signal from Real, each ship of the line raised a large crucifix on its bow. As the opposing fleets drew closer, the Turks came within range of the heavy artillery of the galleasses of the Holy League, stationed a half a mile or more in front of their squadrons. The oversized Venetian vessels let forth a deadly barrage with their centerline bow cannons. Then they pivoted 90 degrees and fired again from their starboard guns. Another quarter turn, and it was the stern battery's chance for action. Then another turn, and the port guns let fire. 
then the bow guns again. In this manner, the galleuses dealt continuous and murderous fire to the Ottoman galleys as they approached the battle line of the Holy League. The Turks had no choice but to muscle their way past the galleuses. They sat far too high in the water to be boarded. Instead, the Turks had to endure the withering fire of hundreds of Spanish arquebusiers blasting away at the Ottoman galleys below. At midday, the fleets closed and engaged. The ship-to-ship fighting began along the Holy League's left flank, where many of the smaller, swifter Turkish galleys were able to maneuver around Augustin Barbarigo's inshore northern flank. The Venetian admiral responded with a near impossibility. He pivoted his entire squadron, 54 ships counterclockwise, and began to pin the Turkish right flank commanded by Mohammed Sirocco against the north shore of the Gulf of Patras. Gaps formed in Barbarigo's line, and Ottoman galleys penetrated the intervals. As galley pulled up along galley, the slaughter brought on by cannon, musket balls, and arrows was horrific. But the Venetians, in time, prevailed. His own galley, set upon by no fewer than eight Ottoman vessels, Barbarigo took an arrow to the eye. Christian slaves aboard the galleys of Scirocco's fleet broke free of their irons and joined the bloody fray, overcoming and strangling Turkish soldiers with their chains. Before Barbarigo died, he learned of the death of Scirocco and the crushing defeat of the Turkish right line. In naval warfare at the time, the convention was that flagships would not engage. In this way, fleet captains could better direct the action of their ships, signaling with flags, trumpet blasts, and flashing lanterns. It was clear from the first that Don John had no plans to follow this convention. Long before the two fleets closed, he had fired off his bow cannon to let the Turkish admiral Ali Pasha know where exactly in the battle line the Real was. Now, as the center squadrons collided, the opposing flagships, Don John's Real and Ali Pasha's Sultana, made straight for one another. Until this point, the demeanor of the 24-year-old Captain General had been nothing but calm. As the two ships drew closer, Don John, in his glistening breastplate, strode carefully up and down the length of his galley, encouraging his men. But in the moment, just before the ships collided, the young warrior let go his reserve and broke into a dance. Europe's most famous dancer, fired by the thrill of the impending battle, danced a galliard on the prow of Real. Decks splintered as the two ships collided. Spanish arquebusiers swept the deck of Sultana with their deadly shot. Turkish archers answered with volley after volley of short black arrows. Don John's Sardinian infantry boarded and drove the Sultana's janissaries back to the mast. 800 men, swords flashing in and out of the thick smoke, traded lethal blows. Ali Pasha's janissaries answered the charge with one of their own, driving the Sardinians back to the Real. Galleys on both sides sped to the aid of the grappled flagships, pouring reinforcements onto the decks of each one. Don John himself led the third charge across Sultana's deck, slippery with grease, blood, and entrails. He was wounded in the leg, but Ali Pasha took a musket ball to the forehead. One of Real's freed convicts lopped off the Turkish admiral's head and held it aloft on a pike. The Christians captured the Muslims' sacred banner with the name of Allah, stitched in gold calligraphy 28,900 times, which Islamic tradition held was carried in battle by the Prophet. 
they raise Rayal's standard over the captured sultana. Bodies and limbs quivered on the scarlet deck. The dead were cast overboard. The sea ran red. But the battle was far from won. On the Holy League's right flank, Gian Andrea Doria was forced to increase the intervals between his galleys to keep his line abreast from being flanked on the south by the larger Ottoman squadron under the command of the Algerian Uluq Ali. The gap between Doria's squadron and Don John's grew larger and larger as the Genovese directed his ships south to block the envelopment. When it was too late, he saw that he had been outmaneuvered. Yuluk Ali now sent his swifter corsairs through the gap to envelop from behind the galleys of Don John's center squadron. Santa Cruz, commanding the Holy League's reserve squadron of 35 galleys, had carefully kept most of his ships out of the fray, sending only a few in to fill gaps in the line or to reinforce the infantry. Now, Santa Cruz sprang into action, first rescuing the center of the Holy League from the Turkish vessels that had surrounded them. Next, he led his squadron south to aid the outman Doria, recapturing Christian vessels that Yulek Ali had taken. The success of Santa Cruz's intervention reveals the wisdom behind Don John's decision to assign command of the reserve squadron to Spain's top admiral. Once the fleets had engaged and galleys had grappled to galleys, Don John's attention would be limited to the action aboard his own vessel and on those surrounding his. He left it to an experienced sea captain to read the battle as it progressed and then to commit his squadron at the time and place that would be most decisive. Santa Cruz fulfilled his orders perfectly and his contribution to the victory of the Holy League cannot be overstated. The fighting lasted for five hours. Over 80% of the Mediterranean world's galleys were present that day. The sides were evenly matched and well led, but the divine favored the Christians. And once the battle turned in their favor, it became a total rout. All But 13 of the Turkish galleys were captured or sunk. In contrast, the Holy League lost only 12 galleys. Over 30,000 Turks were slain, as were about 7,000 Christians. The greatest losses suffered by the Venetians, nearly 5,000. Not until the First World War would the world again witness such carnage in a single day's fighting. Softening the horror of the day was the joy felt by the 15,000 Christian galley slaves that had been set free. In the aftermath of the battle, the Christians gave no quarter, being sure especially to kill the helmsmen, galley captains, archers, and janissaries. The sultan could rebuild ships, but it would be many months before he would have the men of sufficient skill to operate them. Renaissance galleys were complex war machines that were of little use without the experts. The news of the victory made its way back to Rome, but the Pope was already rejoicing. On the day of the battle, Pius had been consulting with his cardinals at the Dominican Basilica of Santa Sabina, on the Aventine Hill. He paused in the midst of their deliberations to look out the window. Up in the sky, the Blessed Mother favored him with a vision of the victory. Turning to his cardinals, he said, let us set aside business and fall on our knees in thanksgiving to God, for he has given our fleet a great victory. When Venice learned of the victory, The Te Deum was sung in the Basilica San Marco, and a week-long celebration followed. In Rome, Marcantonio Colonna, after the tradition of the great Roman generals, mounted a white steed and brought up the rear of a procession through the old city, passing under the arches of Constantine 
Titus and Septimius Severus in the imperial forum. The Pope saw to it that the Captain General of the Holy League did not go unrecognized. Fuit homo misus adeo qui nomen erat Johannes, he declared to the papal court, borrowing from the gospel, a man was sent by God whose name was John. For all the rejoicing, it was within less than a year of the battle that the Holy League Pope St. Pius V had brought together began to crack up. Pius himself died on May 1st of the following year. Christendom mourned, but Sultan Selim II ordered three days and nights of wild feasting in Constantinople to celebrate the death of the man whose leadership had ruined his fleet. Pius's replacement, Gregory XIII, is remembered for his reform of the calendar and for the revised code of canon law, but not for his capacity to quiet the quarrels of the princes of Europe. Disagreements over how next to engage the Ottoman threat eroded the fraternity that had once united the Holy League. The Italian republics and the papal states wanted to take the campaign to the Levant and recover Cyprus and other lost territory. Gregory, however, was a little too much in King Philip's control, and the Spanish king's concern was North Africa. Within a year of the Battle of Lepanto, he had dispatched Don John on a mission to retake Tunis. The young captain general was victorious again, but without the means to sufficiently man the garrison, Philip lost Tunis to the Moors one year later. Don John was next sent by Philip to the Spanish Netherlands, where, as governor, he slowly began to quiet the Dutch rebellion against the Spanish crown, using the same skills for diplomacy and action that had made him the natural leader of the Holy League. But before he could finish his good work, he died of a yet unidentified illness. The black legend has it that Philip, out of jealousy, had his half-brother poisoned, but the best evidence points to a fever contracted from an infection. The date was October 1, 1578, and after receiving last rites and the viaticum, he slipped into a delirium, shouting out commands in one more battle. Don Alvaro de Bazan, whose actions at Lepanto prevented Don John's squadron from being surrounded, went on to win several glorious naval battles for Spain. Philip II assigned Santa Cruz the command of the Spanish Armada, but as he was assembling his fleet in early 1588, he died, and the task was given to Alonso de Guzman el Bueno, Duke of Medina Sidonia, a man of real integrity, but of little seafaring experience. Indeed, he suffered from seasickness, and even less aptitude for war. How different our history might have been if Santa Cruz had lived to command the Armada. Venice signed a peace treaty with the Ottoman Empire on 7 March 1573, two years to the date after the forming of the Holy League. The Venetians ceded Cyprus, causing the anti-Christian Voltaire to quip a century later that the Turks had been the real victors of Lepanto. It is little wonder that Voltaire and his colleagues, as authors of the destructive ideas that have led us to the horrors of total war and its profoundly immoral, unconditional surrender, would reject the merits of a negotiated peace. Since the Enlightenment, it has become fashionable among some historians to dismiss the battle as not decisive. After all, they argue, the Ottomans put to sea another fleet within a couple of years of the battle. This argument withers under scrutiny. The new Ottoman vessels were hastily built of green wood and lacked the experienced sailors of the fleet that had engaged the Holy League. The Ottoman Navy never went on the offensive again, 
And after the defeat at Vienna a century later, the fading of the Ottoman Empire hastened. The scoffers also ignore the effect that the victory at Lepanto had on European morale. Historian W. L. Rogers summarizes the mood across Europe that followed in the wake of the battle. The battle relieved the Christian world of an intolerable dread which had oppressed it for centuries. Men had feared that the steady advance of an Oriental civilization and a hated religion was uncontrollable like the rising tide and Although the material consequences of the battle were slight, the spiritual and psychologic relief to Europe was immeasurable. The stories of that glorious day at the mouth of the Gulf of Patras would fill a book. A young contemporary of Don John's, Miguel Cervantes, fought with abandon and lost his left hand to a Turkish arquebus ball. He kept his right hand to one day pen Spain's greatest novel, Don Quixote. At one point in the battle, Don John's marmoset was seen picking up and throwing overboard Turkish grenades before they could explode. On another galley, a soldier of the Holy League, his soul torn with despair, took his sword to the ship's crucifix. The blade instantly shattered. Many years later, an attempt to reforge the sword was made, but the moment the new blade was pulled from the fire, it immediately fell to pieces. The crucifix on board the Real twisted itself to dodge a Turkish cannonball. It is displayed on a side chapel in the Cathedral of Barcelona. Of interest to American Catholics is an image displayed in the Doria Chapel in the cathedral in Genoa. Gian Andrea Doria carried this gift from the King of Spain on his galley. Exactly 40 years before the Battle of Lepanto, the Blessed Virgin appeared to a peasant leaving a miraculous image of herself on his smock. The bishop of the region immediately commissioned an artist to paint five copies of the image, and he touched each one to the original. Our Lady of Guadalupe was present at Lepanto. Now there is some American Catholic history. In the first lecture, I recommended cultivating a greater awareness of the liturgical calendar as a means to a deeper appreciation of the glorious history of the Catholic Church. In the case of the Battle of Lepanto, we have an additional means, a gift really, a gift so sublime it should probably be called a grace. I speak of G.K. Chesterton's magnificent ballad, Lepanto. If you are unfamiliar with G.K. Chesterton, I encourage you, to pick up Orthodoxy or Everlasting Man or Napoleon of Notting Hill. It almost does not matter where you start. You are sure to become hooked. It is difficult to say what Chesterton was because he was so many things. Journalist, novelist, essayist, playwright, philosopher, and theologian. The corpus of his work is immense which is fitting because so was he, enthusiastic as he was for, in the words of his dear friend Hilaire Belloc, bacon and beer. Chesterton's poetry, however, may be the one thing for which he is underappreciated. His poem Lepanto is the greatest ballad of the 20th century. St. Thomas Aquinas tells us that poetry is the medium to which we turn when the truths we are contemplating do not find sufficient expression in either rhetoric or prose. We might call these truths mysteries, and mysteries are best detected and understood by the heart. To be sure, 
the Battle of Lepanto was a signal moment in political and military history, but it is within the mysterious realm of salvation history that Chesterton's poem unfolds. Today, the West is forced again to confront Islam, and Chesterton's poem reminds us not only what is at stake, but also where our real hope lies. We cannot know all the forms that our war with Islam is going to take in the future. But the ballad makes clear that the West cannot meaningfully engage such an enemy unless it is the Christian West. For this reason, the sacraments and the rosary and the intercession of the Blessed Virgin should be our chief weapons in the fighting that is to come fighting for which Chesterton's poem will fire our hearts. Chesterton wrote the ballad in 1911, 11 years before his conversion to Catholicism, though the poem is fiercely Catholic. He spares not the followers of Calvin and Luther for their betrayal, which he once called nothing less than a mutiny in the face of a common enemy. The poem first appeared in Hilaire Belloc's weekly, The Eyewitness, and Belloc called it not only the summit of Chesterton's achievement in verse, but in all our generation. The poem was instantly popular and remained so for years. John Buchan, author of The 39 Steps, wrote Chesterton from war-torn France in 1914, telling him that English soldiers shouted the poem to one another in the trenches. Little wonder that the poem inspired fighting men. It positively marches in parts. To Belloc's praise, we might add that the poem is a thorough lesson in 16th century European history, revealing the worst villains of that age, the political intrigue, the heresy, and the diabolical fury of the Turkish assault, but also celebrating the piety, fortitude, and Christian chivalry of the period's heroes. If there is a single word to describe the poem, it is rich. Chesterton does not let a line pass without some reference to an historical figure or place or event or theological truth. When we consider that Chesterton dashed off the poem while the mailman waited for the copy, we begin to appreciate the scale of his genius. An excellent analysis of the poem can be found in the American Chesterton Society's volume, Lepanto, edited by Society President Dale Alquist. To do just to every reference in the poem would require at least another lecture, probably a book. Nonetheless, before hearing the poem, let's walk through some of its verses. The ballad opens in the enemy camp. The Soldan of Byzantium, Selim II, is strolling among the fountains in his courts of the sun, his blood-red lips curled like a crescent, the symbol of Islam. He is laughing maniacally because his war galleys terrorize the inmost sea of all the earth, that is, the Mediterranean. They raid with impunity up and down both coasts of Italy, carrying off men doomed to a life of slavery, chained to Turkish galley oars, and women doomed to a life of sexual slavery in the harems of the Ottoman princes. They even dare to raid off the coast of Venice, which Chesterton calls the Lion of the Sea, referring to Venice's patron, St. Mark. Pope Pius's call for swords about the cross has been ignored by the princes of Europe. Charles IX of France, whom Chesterton calls but a shadow of his Valois forebears, cannot even stay awake at Mass. And Queen Elizabeth of England is too busy admiring herself in the mirror. 
Mirrors in Chesterton almost always represent something evil. The wickedest work in the world is symbolized not by a wine glass, but by a looking glass, he once wrote. The Spanish are preoccupied with military adventures on Evening Isles Fantastical. Where are these? Well, what direction is evening? West, the West Indies. And then, something Chesterton loves, a small beginning. After all, Christianity had a small beginning, small and unlikely. In the same fashion, we hear an illegitimate, untitled, 24-year-old man rise up and in one of the most stirring lines of the ballad, this last night of Europe, as Chesterton calls Don John of Austria, takes weapons from the wall. Before long, we have a crusade full of images certain to thrill the hearts of anyone who has ever worn a uniform. Battle standards straining in the night wind, fanfares blasting, drum beats, flickering torchlight, cannons, and we have enough alliteration, meter, and rhyme to thrill anyone who has ever taught fifth grade English. As Don John marches to the sea, Chesterton gives us periodic updates on his progress, even as he is introducing us to the other players in this metaphysical drama. First, we meet Mahound, or Muhammad, who has been resting in the Islamic paradise with his head on the lap of his favorite Hori. He is forced to get up, and he hears the Christian fleet preparing for war. Furious, Mahound summons forth sea monsters and demons from the underworld to meet the threat. It is clear now that the coming fight is one between good and evil to be waged on a spiritual plane, and Chesterton suggests a clash of apocalyptic dimension with reference to the multi-eyed and multi-winged beast of the book of Revelation. Mahound instructs his diabolical army to hunt down Christendom's secret strength, the men of prayer, especially contemplatives, and hermits. Knowing that the faithful will seek the intercession of the saints, Mahound tells his wraiths to dig up and disperse Christian relics. Desecrating Christian shrines in this manner was and is a common practice of Islam. To Mahound, Don John is the return of the crusader. He is Richard Lionheart, Raymond of Toulouse, and Duke Godfrey, first king of Jerusalem. He is one whose loss is laughter when he counts the wager worth. Although out of the mouth of the enemy, there is no more majestic description in verse of the Christian soldier. He goes cheerfully to his death when the cause is Christ's. From the summit of his island mountain in Normandy, famous for its sharply shifting tides, the patron of Christian soldiers, St. Michael the Archangel also attempts to rally forces for the coming conflict. His call falls on deaf ears. Northern Europe is in the throes of the Protestant rebellion. The North is full of tangled things and texts and aching eyes, as Chesterton puts it, referring to the abundance of pamphlets that spread heresy in the 16th century and to the Protestant enthusiasm for sola scriptura. The Reformation, far from bringing reform, has brought discord. Huguenots and Catholics are killing one another in France, and a Frenchman named John Calvin is spreading his errors in Geneva, preaching a new capricious Christ that Chesterton describes as having a newer face of doom, worthy only of dread, because he creates souls only to damn them. Our Blessed Mother, whom Chesterton says God kissed in Galilee, is also a casualty of Protestantism, although it will be Mary whose intercession leads the Holy League to victory in the Gulf of Lepanto. 
In the poem's most cryptic passage, we meet Philip II, King of Spain, son of the late Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, and half-brother of Don John of Austria. Chesterton puts Philip in his closet. The image may be a little unfair, but it is true that Philip II spent much of his time as a king dictating and writing letters and orders from his private study in the Escorial. His style of governance gets mixed reviews from historians. He did preside over a vast and wealthy kingdom, but his lack of flexibility probably doomed, for example, the Spanish Armada in 1588, an event he attempted to run from his study. No matter how deep his Catholic sympathies, to Chesterton, the Spanish Armada was an invasion of England. So, if he indulges in a little black legend propaganda with his portrayal of Philip, we can cut him some slack. In any case, Philip is not writing letters, but he is brewing a poison assisted by dwarves, one of the peculiar features of the Spanish court. He is wearing his golden fleece, symbolizing the unity of the houses of Burgundy and Habsburg. But his face is disfigured. Chesterton does not say for whom the poison is intended, but it was believed for a time that Philip had Don John of Austria poisoned after the battle when Don John was trying, with some success, to quiet rebellion in the Spanish Netherlands. While there is ample evidence that Philip disliked his half-brother and was perhaps jealous of his popularity, the charge of murder does not stand much scrutiny. What is true about Philip is that he suffered periods of madness, as did his mother and his son, Don Carlos. For a just and thorough treatment of the life of one of the 16th century's most important figures, I very much recommend William Thomas Walsh's Philip II. Before the final confrontation, we see Pope Pius V praying before the tabernacle, which Chesterton describes as the secret window whence the world looks small and very dear. Pope Pius has a frightening vision as in a mirror. Again, the mirror is shown as a conduit of darkness. Pius sees the Sultan's galleys casting shadows on the ships of the Holy League, and he sees the wretched conditions endured by the Christian galley slaves who row the ships of the Ottoman fleet. Chesterton compares these slaves to the Hebrews in bondage in Egypt and Babylon and describes the despair and madness into which they have fallen. They have abandoned hope. They have forgotten God. It is just at this moment that God rescues them, not only from their bondage, but also from the bondage of their despair. The Pope now sees that Don John has burst the battle line, defeating the Turks and setting his people free. Surveying the wreckage after the battle, the young Miguel Cervantes sheathes his sword and smiles. Chesterton takes care to tell us that Cervantes' smile is not like the Sultan's, which was inspired by a lust for power. Cervantes has lost his left hand to Ottoman gunfire, but he has perspective enough to focus on eternal truths, to see some comedy in the human condition even amidst so much slaughter he begins to imagine the lean and foolish knight who will become the hero of Spain's greatest novel, Don Quixote, even though it will be 50 years before he sets his right hand to penning it. Cervantes' smile is the very smile we need after our victories and especially after our defeats. And now, Lepanto by G.K. Chesterton. White founts falling in the courts of the sun, 
and the soldan of Byzantium is smiling as they run. There is laughter like the fountains in that face of all men feared. It stirs the forest darkness, the darkness of his beard. It curls the blood-red crescent, the crescent of his lips. For the inmost sea of all the earth is shaken with his ships. They have dared the white republics up the capes of Italy. They have dashed the Adriatic round the line of the sea. And the Pope has cast his arms abroad for agony and loss and called the kings of Christendom for swords about the cross. The cold Queen of England is looking in the glass. The shadow of the Valois is yawning at the mass. From evening isles fantastical rings faint the Spanish gun. And the Lord upon the golden horn is laughing in the sun. Dim drums throbbing in the hills, half heard, where only on a nameless throne a crownless prince has stirred, where risen from a doubtful seat and half a tainted stall, the last knight of Europe takes weapons from the wall. The last and lingering troubadour to whom the bird has sung that once went singing southward when all the world was young. In that enormous silence, tiny and unafraid, comes up along a winding road the noise of the crusade. Strong gongs groaning as the guns boom far. Don John of Austria is riding to the war. Stiff flags straining in the night blast cold. In the gloom black purple in the glint old gold. Torchlight crimson on the copper kettle drums. Then the tuckets, then the trumpets, then the cannon and he comes. Don John laughing in the brave beard curled. Spurning of his stirrups like the thrones of all the world. Holding his head up for a flag of all the free. Love light of Spain. Hurrah! Death light of Africa, Don John of Austria, is riding to the sea. Mahound is in his paradise above the evening star. Don John of Austria is going to the war. He moves a mighty turban on the timeless warrior's knees, his turban that is woven of the sunsets and the seas. He shakes the peacock gardens as he rises from his ease, and he strides among the treetops and is taller than the trees, and his voice through all the garden is a thunder sent to bring black Azrael and Ariel and Ammon on the wing, giants and the genii, multiplex of wing and eye, whose strong obedience broke the sky when Solomon was king. They rush in red and purple from the red clouds of the morn, from temples where the yellow gods shut up their eyes in scorn. They rise in green robes, roaring from the green hells of the sea, where fallen skies and evil hues and eyeless creatures be. On them the sea valves cluster and the gray sea forests curl, splashed with a splendid sickness, the sickness of the pearl, They swell in sapphire smoke out of the blue cracks of the ground. They gather and they wonder and give worship to Mahound. And he saith, Break up the mountains where the hermit folk may hide and sift the red and silver sands lest bone of saint abide and chase the adjures flying night and day not giving rest For that which was our trouble comes again out of the West. We have set the seal of Solomon on all things under sun, of knowledge and of sorrow and endurance of things done. But a noise is in the mountains and the mountains, and I know that voice that shook our palaces 400 years ago. It is he that saith not kismet. It is he that knows not fate. It is Richard, it is Raymond, it is Godfrey at the gate. It is he whose loss is laughter when he counts the wager worth. Put down your feet upon him, that our peace be on the earth. For he heard drums groaning, and he heard guns jar. Don John of Austria is going to the war. Sudden and still, hurrah, bolt from Iberia. Don John of Austria is gone by Alcalar. St. Michael's on his mountain in the sea roads of the north. Don John of Austria is girt and going forth. 
where the gray seas glitter and the sharp tides shift and the sea folk labor and the red sails lift. He shakes his lance of iron and he claps his wings of stone. The noise has gone through Normandy. The noise has gone alone. The north is full of tangled things and texts and aching eyes and dead is all the innocence of anger and surprise. And Christian killeth Christian in a narrow, dusty room. And Christian dreadeth Christ that hath a newer face of doom. And Christian hateth Mary that God kissed in Galilee. But Don John of Austria is riding to the sea. Don John calling through the blast and the eclipse, crying with the trumpet, with the trumpet of his lips, trumpet that saith, Ha! Domino Gloria! Don John of Austria is shouting to the ships. King Philip's in his closet with the fleece about his neck. Don John of Austria is armed upon the deck. The walls are hung with velvet that is black and soft as sin, and little dwarves creep out of it, and little dwarves creep in. He holds a crystal phial that has colors like the moon. He touches, and it tingles, and he trembles very soon. And his face is as a fungus of a leprous white and gray, like plants in the high houses that are shuttered from the day. And death is in the file, and the end of noble work. But Don John of Austria has fired upon the Turk. Don John's hunting and his hounds have bayed, booms away past Italy the rumor of his raid. Gun upon gun, ha-ha! Gun upon gun, hurrah! Don John of Austria has loosed the cannonade. The Pope was in his chapel before day or battle broke. Don John of Austria is hidden in the smoke. The hidden room in man's house where God sits all the year, the secret window whence the world looks small and very dear. He sees as in a mirror on the monstrous twilight sea the crescent of his cruel ships whose name is mystery. They fling great shadows forwards, making cross and castle dark. They veil the plumed lions on the galleys of St. Mark. And above the ships are palaces of brown, black-bearded chiefs. And below the ships are prisons, where with multitudinous griefs, Christian captives, sick and sunless, all a laboring race repines, like a race in sunken cities, like a nation in the mines, they are lost like slaves that swat and in the skies of morning hung. The stairways of the tallest gods when tyranny was young. They are countless, voiceless, hopeless as those fallen or fleeing on before the high king's horses in the granite of Babylon. And many a one grows witless in his quiet room in hell where a yellow face looks inward through the lattice of his cell, and he finds his God forgotten, and he seeks no more a sign. But Don John of Austria has burst the paddle line, Don John pounding from the slaughter-painted poop, purpling all the ocean like a bloody pirate sloop, scarlet running over on the silvers and the golds, breaking of the hatches up and bursting of the holds, thronging of the thousands up that labor under sea, white for bliss and blind for sun and stunned for liberty. Viva Hispania, Domino Gloria, Don John of Austria has set his people free. Cervantes on his galley sets the sword back in the sheath. Don John of Austria rides homeward with a wreath and he sees across a weary land a straggling road in Spain, up which a lean and foolish knight forever rides in vain. And he smiles, but not as Sultan smile, and settles back the blade. But Don John of Austria rides home from the crusade. My friends, take up Lepanto. Give it to your children and have them memorize it. Bribe them if you have to, as I have done. 
When you give them this poem, you will be giving them a great moment in the history of Christendom. But more than that, you will be reminding their hearts that when things are black, we can look with total confidence to the victory of the cross. <laughs> <laughs>